Welcome to my lecture series on contemporary European composers. Today we talk about the Spanish Catalan composer Hector Parra. Hector Parra was born 1976. He is a well known and established composer. He studied in Barcelona and Paris with Jonathan Harvey, Brian Fernieu, Philippe Manoury, and Michel Charel. And last decade, he became quite active as an opera composer. Until now, he already has six operas. I use pieces of him in my classes on contemporary music and contemporary opera. In both classes, I use pieces by Parra to talk about possible connections between music and nature science. So how to use theories of nature science as inspiration and models for composition. In the examples of my class, there was evolution theory and particle theory my main focus. But he has other interests as well, especially literature and paintings. Those interests will also be part of this lecture. Following his interests, this lecture is structured in four major parts. First, composer background and inspiration in general. Second, pieces inspired by nature art will be the main part. Third, pieces inspired by art, especially paintings. And fourth, his latest operas, which are again are very different from his earlier pieces. I will use the following pieces to portray the composer. You see them on screen. There is chamber music, orchestra and opera, and also piano solo, to also show his variety of musical languages. As always in my lectures, I only provide a first introduction into specific parts of his musical world. I hope I will be able to trigger more interest in his music by doing so. Let's begin with the first part. Hector Parra's interest into nature science, especially physics, for sure also was shaped by his father, who is a physicist. Black holes, micromaterials and many other phenomena shape the structure and aesthetics of his pieces. Not only physics, also chemistry and evolution theory, for example. But as important as those influences are, his interest in poetry, literature and also fine arts is also important. His nature science interests can also meet with inspiration from poetry or other arts. In Paris music they can merge. A piece like Mineral Life deals with genetic takeover theories and at the same time also refers to a poem by Paul Celan. For both worlds, art and nature sciences, Parra does deep research for his pieces, trying to understand both fundamentally and then find a way to form out of this understanding a new piece. Inspiration for Parra is also always intensive research. Over years, the language he created out of this research became his natural language. Detailed complex structures where rhythm, pitch and intonation are depending on each other. Parra composes quite virtuosic. A look at his scores and also their graphic aspect reveals this immediately. Yet he has a remarkably melodic writing in some of his pieces. The interest in science shapes the musical forms and texture of some of his pieces. Especially Parra's unique form concepts have been inspired by biology and physics. We will see this in examples later. Electronic sounds also have been important for his aesthetics. He studied and was also teacher at IRCAM in Paris. Live sound transformation, spatialization, also meaning distributing sound in a room using speakers, so basically complex surround sound effects, are part of his ensemble pieces and operas. They are often also highly relevant dramaturgically. Important is that even though scientific ideas are of high importance to him, he first is a composer doing music. The music and sound of a piece therefore is what he does and not scientific research. He therefore does not aim to transfer scientific data as accurate as possible into music. That would not be interesting. It would also not be really composition, it would rather be sonification of data. The scientific models are inspiration which is taken very seriously. But that also means that he transforms this into a dramatic shape and into pieces of certain aesthetics that also can be heard musically and understood musically if you don't study the theories behind it. They are latent structure embedded in a piece, sometimes visible or sometimes hidden. In his latest operas, he was searching for more literature-inspired topics and a more traditional approach on opera than in his first operas. But it's also his musical style evolved. The pieces I present here 
only cover about 16-15 years, but you will hear significant aesthetic differences, but also some similarities in the pieces. Okay, let's move to the second part of the lecture. This will be the main part of the lecture. As I think it's quite unique how Para uses scientific research and knowledge to shape his music. Let's start with his interest in astrophysics and his piece Inscape from 2018. The piece is based on astrophysical phenomena in the context of black hole. The dilation of time, the formation of a black hole, the concept of the event horizon and so on. But those are again inspiration and models Para uses to compose the piece. If you would do a detailed analysis of the piece, we would as well need to understand them in detail. The piece also was developed together with an astrophysicist. So, as I said in the beginning, Para takes those models and his inspiration very seriously. For our introduction here, it's not necessary. Para wants to compose how it would like to be if you would be sucked into a black hole or travel through a black hole. And that basically also becomes poetry. It's something we can only imagine. We cannot know how it's for sure. The concert hall becomes his universe, or the universe. In the center there is an ensemble with eight soloists, behind them an orchestra. Other soloists are distributed in the concert hall, so there's a full surround sound. In addition, the soloists on stage are also live electronically altered, so they have small microphones. And there are speakers in the room as well, of course. It is based on technology of IRCAM. The electronics also create sounds not possible to realize by the orchestra and are adding up to a virtual sound atmosphere. So a space and black hole feeling is created in this piece. The piece starts with an already nervous moving texture. And the soloists are present already. We hear that there is a huge potential that will soon explode or technically correct actually implode. The piece builds up its energy and then it becomes more and more intense. The electronic treating is also part of this. Like the gravity is turned apart in a black hole, light is blended and complex bended, sorry, and complex processes are happening. Lots of details of how in theory this would work have been formulated in mathematical models. Power takes them and transfers those ideas into music. Then Para takes the listener inside the black hole. Forms of rotation, complex polyphony and surround sound create a rough atmosphere. Gravitational waves are represented by electronic sounds. Extreme forces are presented here musically. A virtual journey a human would not survive. But at the other side of the black hole there awaits a new world. Like a wormhole we are brought into another part of the universe. The piece itself is then a journey, or in a musical terms, a transformation from our space through a black hole to another space. The question is now, what is it what awaits us on the other side? A new musical world, new type of texture, new music not heard before. Para aims for an exciting transition to a new place. This was a first impression, a teaser, so to say. I will now use another piece to show more detailed how he transforms theories of nature science into a musical piece. His piece Early Life for Oboe, Piano and String Tree, composed in 2010, is based on the genetic takeover theory by the Scottish biochemist Graham Thurns Smith. In Early Life, Para attempts to create a musical structure inspired by the large scale and long time biological process of evolution. Especially interesting is the question how it began. What were the first steps that created light out of an organic material? So it had to start somewhere. One idea how this could have happened is the theory called Genetic Takeover by Graham Thurn Smith. In his model, life evolves out of mineral replication of clay, out of early material existing on our planet. Those clay mineral structures would replicate themselves over and over again. Replication of existing structures is the main idea here. But this does not create life or anything new, it just creates more of the same. But in this replication world still lies the possibility to create life. And actually a very beautiful and again musical idea. The error or the mistake. Beside replication, 
error is a central factor of evolution. So in this replication, replication process, due to whatever reasons, there may be mistakes. So the newly replicated cell is somehow different from the others. It is strictly speaking defect. And such a defect can then also be replicated and grow and get more and more and can have other defects then as well. So there can be a chain of defects in such a growth process. Replication or repetition and error are the two concepts that are also already quite musical. They are a concept of variation. What I just described in a genetic perspective is a developing variation. There's a melody, then it's repeated but a little bit is changed, one duration or one pitch, this becomes then a new melody and again it's repeated with a little defect and again there's a new variation. After a while it will be very different from the beginning. This is quite similar to the melodic concept of Schönberg or Brahms. Those defects would after a while create different types of mineral structures, different types of clay. Some are hard, some are soft, some very fragile. Sir and Smith would say that over time some defected clay crystals develop the ability to synthesize organic molecules through photosynthesis. These early pre-cellular organisms began to build membranes, microtubes, interconnected compartments and other stuff that helped such synthesis. This led to organisms that contained inorganic genes but also organic genes, so a mix of dead matter and plants. This is one theory how organic life was evolving, out of mistakes. On screen you can see how this can work. G1 is growing and replicating. In this growing process also G2 is created by metabolism or by an error in the clay model. G2 now is also growing but more rapidly than G1 and it finally replaces G1 and the organism evolves to G2. Something similar is happening again. In the next step it might create G3 and so on. Something new always pushes away old stuff. But the new is created by the old. This is also a quite musical process. Similar things happen also in Paris piece, early life and mineral life. Early life begins without oboe, only with the strings and the prepared piano playing relatively symmetrical and short patterns. An initial mineral clay structure. The sound you hear first is a dry, percussive and rhythmically already complex texture, like the mineral structure. Then errors come in. Errors in the piece are different playing techniques, unexpected pauses, changes in instrumentation, rhythmic shifts and so on. Those errors are then repeated and imitated by other instruments and registers. Because of those errors, the rhythmic complexity and trimbral richness grows progressively and reaches their peak at the central part of the piece. Until then, lots of different clay types have been composed by Para. Para uses four major different types of clay structures. Some are sticky, some are tough, hard, or some are cloggy. They are represented by musical textures composed accordingly to their clay type. Then something exciting is happening. The oboe joins in, a new string, not a string instrument anymore. The oboe is the first organic material in this evolution process. Organic material evolved out of inorganic material. It represents the first biological alive cell. The second part of early life then becomes a microdrama, where the oboe as a soloist um, becomes the center. The piece then also almost becomes an oboe concerto. The oboe also grows quite complex and virtuosic. And then a complex biological life is created. The end is a downfall coda. So what does this mean? Extinction maybe or the end of life? Power leaves this open. So the piece remains actually quite interesting until its very end. I want to show you that scientific ideas like in Inkscape or early life can also be used for an opera. This is also a great way to realize the wide variety of phenomena in our world composers can take as a source of material. 
It's not only literature or history or paintings or nature. It's also nature is science. For his music theater piece Hypermusic Prologue, Para used theories and ideas from particle physics, or here actually string theory, specifically the model of Lisa Randall and Raman syndrome. Hector Para was reading Randall's book Warped Passages and was very fascinated by the structural beauty of this model. In her research, she is working on combining several opposing theories together to one. Gravity and how it works for big and very small objects, for example, is part of this research. In her theoretical model, she uses five dimensions to formulate her ideas. She suggests that space and time might be curved, so strongly curved that there are areas in time and space we cannot access or see. This will be the fifth dimension. Art can help us see things that in a normal world, based on rational and logical perception and also lots of bias and ideology, cannot be seen by us. Like in Cubism, for example. Here Picasso merges several perspectives, like views from different angles into one perspective. He plays with dimensions and changes their disposition in space. Also in Surrealism or Futurism, with their studies on movement, we can see and maybe understand certain processes or relations better. So Hector Parra asked Lisa Randall if she would be interested to write an opera libretto based on her ideas. And she said yes. So there are two roles in the opera, two scientists, male and female. She has a new theory, but he cannot understand. He does not believe in her. Reality for him is what he can see and study. For her, this reality is just a construct that can also be completely different. She wants to find new ways of exploring it. She is then able to go to the fifth dimension, where everything is different. She finds a new language there, and the music is quite different. Using opera as the form to tell the story has an other meaning for the composer here as well. For many people, opera is to be, to be considered an old traditional form, like an old safe idea you can rely on. All is based on old laws, experience and tradition. Like the old way of physics, the male scientist of this piece here still believes in. Hector Parra wants to create a new form of opera, a new form of listening by expanding the old reality and shifting it to a new dimension. At the beginning of the piece, it all, sides more, it all sounds more or less like a normal opera. But when she then enters the fifth dimension, we travel into a very contemporary new music world. So the form opera itself becomes a dramaturgical tool here. Let's have a look now how this transition is put into music. So the major and most interesting part of this opera is the shift from the fourth dimensional world to the fifth dimensional world. Those two worlds are different in several aspects and those differences are shown by musical variation. According to Lisa Randall and her model, space and distance is different in the fifth dimension. In the piece this variation is turned into the variation of the time duration of a motif and electronic modifications like delay and time stretch effects. And time itself is also changing. Here the composer uses different uh, rhythmic variations to show this. Mass is also changing. Here the color of sound and the overtone spectrum is altered. For example, by using special playing techniques or different bow pressure on the strings. More mass means more pressure. And energy levels are also changing. Here the composer changes dynamics, attacks, accelerando in order to transform these changes into music. So if you travel between the dimensions, all of these parameters change. The material is actually very simple. Often it's just small musical phrases or a few particles basically. Maybe just one bar. It's all about how they change in their journey to the fifth dimension. And due to the extreme differences between the dimensions, also this musical material changes a lot. Also the singers and their way of singing is changed by those parameters and also depend on which dimension they are. In which dimension they are. When they are in the fourth dimension, their singing is quite normal, but in the fifth dimension it is quite complex. Para tries to also develop a new form of language. Splitting the language into small particles and using live electronics and 
and spatialization effects to distribute the language into the room and onto instruments. So for example, you hear a consonant sound from the cello, one sound from behind you, from a flute, and one from the stage. There maybe you hear a vowel sung from a singer. And all together they form this new language. Even though Hector Parra sometimes quite directly transforms Randall's concept into musical variations, he never just blindly applies a set of given rules to material, like a simple algorithm, for example. He makes a piece of music theater. He is in control of the material and shapes it as an artist. It is at the end music inspired by nature, similar to a composer who tries to capture, in an artistic way, the atmosphere of a certain landscape or the sound of wind, something composers are already doing for centuries. Scientific models can be a bridge for the composer to reconnect to nature. We now move on to the third part of the lecture. The piano plays an important role in Paris' compositional life. For example, in his extremely virtuosic piano sonata from 2010. I now want to introduce a small piece for solo piano, Coste Materia. I use this to show also his interest in fine art, which is not necessarily a contrast to the interest in nature science. Often both areas of inspiration are combined in one piece. Parra is also rooted in his own culture, the Catalan culture within Spain. It is an autonomous region with their own language and culture. His piece, Costa Materia, is dedicated to the Catalan painter Antoni Tapies. Tapies' aesthetic roots are in surrealism and cubism. But then he developed a quite unique style. His paintings become more and more abstract, and he became one of the most influential painters of the art movement and styled informalism. He also uses lots of other material. He glues wood, fabric and all kinds of things to his paintings. He would also use sand on his painting and then scratches his lines into it. Parra took his painting Body of Matter and Orange Marks as inspiration. Painting and objects are combined here. Also as if the objects prolong the painting into the world of things and into the room. The piece also has a charming lightness. It's not a heavy dark piece of art. There is something playful to it. Parra also transforms these aspects into music. Major material of Parra's piece are chords in the middle register of the piano. Parra's piece starts calm and then builds up and gets more energetic, including tremolo martellato passages, like he would shape and hammer a sculpture. Chroma 1 from 2006 is based on a painting by Cézanne, Chateau Noir, the Dark Castle. Parra was interested in the colors and their modulations and vibrations in this particular painting. There is also a light that is fading like a process, beginning from the center towards its outer corners. Also, in this dynamics, Para was interested. The light is almost spectrally analyzed in this painting. This also creates a feeling of perspective, almost like 3D. Even so, the painting is quite plain. This is an interesting dialectical duality. The abstract textures of Cézanne are as well as inspiration for Para. Parra's music takes inspiration from all of this, actually. Chroma is a sequence of musical material which brings the painting into a timeline. Also the, painted, also the painted textures come to life in his piece and become moving musical textures. All of this is formed by Parra accordingly to the color, light and depth modulations of the painting by Cézanne, all based on different orchestral colors. We now move on to the fourth part of the lecture. Content and aesthetics will change now drastically. We are talking about his latest operas. His first opera was mainly based on electronic sounds. His second opera was Hyper Music Prologue, what we just discussed before. Then followed the opera Das Geopferte Leben, which is quite different already. Here Parra worked on the way voice was used in Baroque opera. He worked with a Baroque orchestra and a contemporary music ensemble. Then followed the opera Wild, based on a text by the writer Handel Klaus. Handel Klaus' texts already are quite musical. He is also librettist for composers such as Beat Fuhrer or Georg Friedrich Haas. 
he has a wonderful feeling of how to structure language so it is first usable in opera but also inspires opera composers. The opera is also based on a piece by Handel Klaus with the same title Wild or Wilde, which means the wild ones. Language is similar to Para's prior opera, Das geopferte Leben, a major aspect of this opera. There are already a lot of references in the text itself, references to each other, not quotes to other texts. And the text also avoids emotional descriptions. So the text leaves a lot open for the composer and also the audience. There's a lot of ambiguity or potential or potentials for interesting misunderstandings. This is also one of the ways this text creates tension and dramatic moments. Para tries to prolong and expand those tensions and ambiguous meanings. The texts are often cut into each other, just a few words like a staccato hocket. Hocket is like old technique when a melody is distributed onto more voices, to the Renaissance technique. So there are lots of associations, and in them slowly the story unfolds. I will only give a short overview of the story. A doctor who worked abroad returns home. Unfortunately, he gets out of a train at the wrong station, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, an empty city. He meets two brothers who ask him to stay in their house for the night. And now strange things are happening. Those brothers seem crazy, but also the doctor, we realize, had some traumatic events in his prior life. Also, violent scenes happen later at a petrol station, and all is a bit absurd. He finally got stuck there with this strange family in this strange house. I want to link back to our second topic, art. This is also part of this opera. Surrealism and also surreal architecture were a major inspiration for Para. The house of the brothers is strange, like as if it's combined of many houses. Here his interest in other art forms is again part of the inspiration. The house Ur by the artist Georg Schneider, who builds rooms and buildings basically as artworks. His famous piece, or most, most famous piece, is the house Ur. In this house, there were extra walls, small rooms, even motors that could change the wall of the rooms. It became a claustrophobic, strange house with small rooms where you have to climb from one to another. It's a very strange experience to go into one of his artworks. Another inspiration was Gordon Mata Clark's architectural artwork Office Baroque, where he, into a building, cut it a real hole. And basically, it was cutting the building. The orchestra of the piece also tries to describe those strange places, including the empty grey city. Often this orchestral description of the city is in contrast to the text. There are also a lot of style quotes as well in the music. Music that sounds like Bach, Wagner or others, but is not. All of this is making the music quite dense and meaningful, yet also quite operatic, almost romantic. The two brothers often sing like they are from a Baroque opera, a countertenor and an alto. They are portrayed um, a bit as devilish characters, so something's wrong with them. Their melodies are highly chromatic. Their orchestration is quite rich, as if they want to lure and seduce the doctor. Also, the sisters are seducing and quite colorful in their vocal lines and orchestration. After a while, also, the sound of the doctor is eaten by the sound of the strange family, so he is musically integrated into the family at the end of the opera, sounding like them. At the end of the lecture, I want to show a few fragments of his latest opera, which again is quite different to his other pieces, in content and in aesthetics. It is an opera based on a book by Jonathan Littell, called in English The Kindly Ones, written in 2006. It's like a stream of consciousness. A former SS Nazi tells his story. He's part of the Holocaust, the mass murdering of millions of Jews committed by the Nazis. The author tries to portray the thoughts of this SS officer. Awful situations and thoughts, but also reality, are portrayed in this book. There was a lot of discussion about this. It is in some aspects quite shocking and extremely uncomfortable to read. The author did lots of historical research on the topic. The book is also inspired by Greek mythology. 
Every chapter, chapter of the book is titled like a baroque dance, following a baroque suite, Ducata, Alemont, and so on. Every chapter is one part of the life of the SS officer. Hent Klaus turned it into a libretto and Para composed the opera. It is a piece of almost three hours. Para uses lots of quotations to other music like Bach or Albenberg. The music is dense and full of contrasts. Often shrill sounds like attacks or painful emotions are breaking in. The music tries to portray the complex character. Between fulfilling order, self-perception, guilt and many more. It is in many aspects quite different to his pieces before. Especially those working on scientific models. This is why it's quite interesting. It also shows us that Para is an immensely resourceful composer. We cannot just limit to his interest in scientific uh, models.